her son to ask him to come home. Is it true, she says, is it true? And somewhere the bombs are still falling. Somewhere my neighbor puts his hands in the air. What's true is that the sound of destruction has always followed the sound of our allegiance. Like you, I am afraid of many things. At a cafe, I sit across from a friend and I ask her when she's going to the polls. As I watch her consider her schedule, I wait. And I wait, even as the table burns between us and the cream colored walls crumble to dust and the soy lattes and chai teas spill all over the floor and why am I still waiting? Hand over my heart, looking so citizen-like, my Sunday best, my perfect English, my American friend, who in a moment will pick her chai tea off the floor and go vote. Thank you. Thank you so much, Serena, for sharing your time and your talents with us. Um, that was so moving and I hope it really sets the tone for the rest of our evening. Um, so the next thing we're going to move into is we're going to play a quick Kahoot trivia game. Um, I do want to give a disclaimer. There's only about 50 seats available to play in the game. So staff and ambassadors who are watching, if you could uh, refrain from joining, since I know many of you already have tote bags, that's uh, that would be amazing. Um, so our top three winners will be sent um, one of our limited edition NYC Votes tote bags. Here's our amazing ambassador mentor, Anna, modeling them for you all. Um, so when you log into Kahoot, if you haven't played before, you can open another tab in your browser or play from your phone. You'll just go to kahoot.it um, and enter the pin to join the game. I'm gonna start it in just a minute and you'll see the pin on the screen. Um, if you're a top three winner, um, you know, make sure that you make your nickname, your first name, and at least your last initial so we can verify it's you. Um, you can send me an email at obrady at nyccfb.info and we'll make sure you get your tote bag mailed. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and reshare my screen um, with this Kahoot game. So the game pin is 8244495, and I will drop that in the chat. And if folks are watching on Facebook Live, you are also welcome to join. We'll give it another minute for folks to join in. Okay, final call. We'll give it like 10 more seconds. Perfect. All right, let's go ahead and get started. At what age can you pre-register to vote in New York State? All right, most of you got that one right. 
Um, again, in New York State, you can pre-register at 16. If you have a driver's license or a state ID, you can do that online through the DMV. Um, if not, you'll need a paper form, um, which you can go to our website, voting.nyc, and download a PDF version. All right, looks like Ryan's in the lead. How many mayors has NYC had to date? Uh, the correct answer is 109. Mayor de Blasio is our 109th mayor, so we'll be voting for our 110th mayor this fall. Um, up to how many candidates can you rank in a ranked choice voting election? Correct, five is the correct answer. Um, again, this uh, year we had our first ranked choice voting elections. We will not be using ranked choice voting in the fall because it's only in place for special and primary elections, not for general elections, but it's always good to, to brush up on your RCV skills. What percent of youth between 18 and 29 voted in the 2020 presidential election? Awesome. Oh, that was a tough one. Only two of you got that one right. But yes, 53%. It was pretty good uh, youth voter turnout for us that year. Can always be improved. Um, who is the current NYC comptroller? I'll be super impressed by the young people in the audience who get this one right. Oh my gosh, good job guys. Uh, so yes, Scott Stringer is our current NYC comptroller. For folks who don't know, the comptroller um, monitors the, the city's budget, makes sure that funds are being used appropriately and for what they're intended for. True or false, to vote in a primary election in New York State, you must be registered with a political party. True or false? Awesome, most of you got that one right too. Yes, so in New York State, you do have to be registered with a political party. We have what are called uh, for, to, in order to vote in a primary election. For a general election, you don't have to be registered with a party, but we do have closed primary elections. What year was the national voting age lowered from 21 to 18? All right, good job, a lot of you knew that one. Um, so in 1971, um, a constitutional amendment was passed, the 26th Amendment, which lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. This was spurred by youth organizers um, in the middle of the Vietnam War who believed that if they were old enough to be drafted to, to fight in a war that they should also be old enough to vote. When does early voting begin for the November 2nd election? Awesome. Again, a lot of you got that one right too. Early voting will begin on October 23rd and it'll run right up until the Sunday before election day. Um, your early voting site may be different than your election day site. So make sure you visit voting.nyc to you know, make a plan to vote, find your poll site and figure out what works best for you. What is the largest borough in terms of area? 
So not in terms of population, but which borough is just the largest, has the most land. That was a tough one. Queens is the largest borough in terms of area. Um, and just a few more questions left. True or false, any eligible voter can request an absentee ballot online in NYC. You guys got that one so fast. Everyone got that one right. Yes, so all New Yorkers, because of the pandemic, are eligible to request an absentee ballot online. The website is um, absentee.nyc. Um, it's super easy to remember. Um, how many students are currently are, are enrolled in the Department of Education schools? This is data from last year. So. I'll, oh, that one trip pulls up. Um, so there are about 1.1 million students currently enrolled um, in, or as of last year, enrolled in the Department of Education schools. Um, uh, we have the largest public school district in the country. Last question, when is the voter registration deadline for the November 2nd election? Ooh, that one trip looks up too. So October 8th is the last day to register to vote um, to participate in the November 2nd general election. Um, and something that's cool about this election this year is that one of the ballot proposals is actually to um, create same day voter registration. Um, okay, so let's see who our winners are. In third place, Ashley C. In second place, we have Corey and our reigning champion, Sabrina T. Awesome. So thank you guys so much for participating um, in this with me. If you're one of our top three winners, please send me an email. Um, I'm dropping my email in the chat. Um, it's obrady at nyccfb.info. Thank you guys for playing. Um, so as we progress in our evening. Um, I'd now like to welcome a James Larison and Anna Luokai, um, who are our amazing Lead Power NYC Ambassador Mentors, who are going to tell us a little bit about the Ambassador Program. Anna and James, the floor is yours. Okay, I guess I can go first. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Lukai. I use she, her pronouns. I am an East Asian woman. I'm 22 years old. I'm wearing a light blue shirt. I have brown hair and I'm in front of a white background. So I am one of two ambassador mentors for the We Power NYC program under NYC Votes. Um, and I am proud to call myself a product of the CUNY system as a recent graduate of the City College of New York slash Macaulay Honors College. And I currently work at a nonprofit called All in Together, where I continue to work in the civics and politics space. James? Hi, can everyone hear me? My apologies, I was just calling in. Um, so my name is James Larison. I am a Black person with a flat top. Um, with a hallway, a mirror, and a painting behind them. I use they, them pronouns. Um, and I'm one of, um, I'm the other uh, We Power NYC ambassador, ambassador mentors for this application cycle. I'm a rising junior at Hunter College and currently am the civic engagement uh, slash community engagement chair for the BSU of CUNY. Next slide.
Okay, so we're going to be discussing a bit about the We Power NYC Ambassador Program, the ambassadors, and also the work we've done thus far. So I think the question at hand is who are the ambassadors? Um, well, We Power NYC is an initiative by, by young people for young people, namely New Yorkers from ages 14 to 24 who are very passionate about increasing youth engagement in local elections and those who also deeply care about our city. Um, the ambassadors come from all five boroughs and we utilize social media to develop and share content on voting, civic engagement and local elections um, for their respective communities, um, especially younger audiences like ourselves. Next slide. Um, so um, the ambassador started off the conversation in the community about voting and civic engagement, especially on local and state elections. No one com comes in as an expert on these topics. So we receive training on, it, on effective digital organizing and communication strategies, which results in our social media posts where we share voting information, promote NYC votes youth events, and spread awareness of election related information. Ambassadors also do a lot of work outside of social media, and that includes phone slash text banking, hosting their own get out the vote events in their schools and communities, speaking to the media about youth concerns slash needs, and a whole host of other responsibilities. On a regular basis, we also partake in weekly meetings to discuss local issues, plan events and programming, and foster for further community building. I'm proud to say that We Power Ambassador Program brings youth across all five boroughs, many of us coming from marginalized communities. It's important to have programs such as We Power NYC because often our voices are overlooked as youth. The program provides the opportunity to be in rooms with like-minded individuals and honing our skills to have a real impact in our community through outreach. We can make a difference with programs like these. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I also just want to share a little bit of um, youth voter turnout data. This is from 2018, but patterns are relatively consistent. Um, as you can see, unsurprisingly, right, neighborhoods in the city that um, tend to have more white people living in them, tend to have more affluent populations, they have higher voter turnout as compared to neighborhoods um, that do not have access to these same resources, right? And so one of the things that's really important about this particular program is that all of our ambassadors are paid to do this work um, in order to you know allow for young people who um, you know are at the front lines of these issues we have to be able to also support them with material resources to do this really important work of building community and, and starting conversations um, so again thank you to James and Anna for sharing a bit about the program and thank you for all the incredible work that you've done in helping me run meetings um, and supporting your groups and their final research projects um, so for the rest of the evening, we're going to transition and we'll go back and forth between presentations from the ambassadors um, on uh, their final research projects, um, and we'll switch between that and spoken testimony. Um, so our first group that's going to go up to present is the urban planning group of the ambassadors, um, and you'll hear from Nikita Chernin, Nafisa Tunkara, and Camila Jimenez. Um, followed uh, after their short presentation, uh, we will hear from Bradley Hershenson, Mia Payne, and Aman Chaudhry, who are all providing spoken testimony. And I do apologize in advance if I've mispronounced anyone's names. Feel free to correct me when you come up. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass it over to our urban planning group. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Camila Jimenez. Um, I'm a female. I have brown curly hair. I'm wearing glasses. I have brown eyes. And my background is just my very messy bedroom. So hi, once again, um, our final project is going to be about urban planning and the effects of COVID on urban planning and how that's going to sort of change what living in New York City is like going forward. So if for anyone who doesn't know, urban planning is a development and maintenance of cities. So obviously that impacts our lives a lot because we live in a city. <laughs> 
So we chose to learn more about Open Streets in particular, which is an initiative created by New York to bring us together in a time where we had to be apart because of social because of social distancing. Okay, I'll pass it on to Nikita. So my name is Nikita. Uh, I am I have brown hair and I have a green shirt on right now, and I will be continuing to explain a bit more about our project. Um, we uh, decided to focus on open streets. So open streets um, is um, was created during the COVID-19 pandemic, and it allows streets to be closed to from motor transport and only open for pedestrian passing. Um, and then we also saw the influx of this other program called Open Restaurants, which allows um, restaurants to use space on the sidewalks of these open streets, which allows them to service more people in a co- Nikita, you're on mute. You did yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to pass. Uh, sorry, I didn't. Um, I didn't pass the mic over. I'm going to pass the mic over to Camilla, which is uh, who's going to finish off explaining a bit about our project. I'm actually going to take um, this portion. So hi, guys, my name is Nafisa. Um, I have a blue shirt. I have braids on. And my background is my messy dorm room. Sorry, I'm moving out soon. Um, so while we do have a lot more to share, we wanted to leave you guys with three fun facts that we learned during our research thus far. So one is that urban, urban planners can specialize in different things such as transportation planning, community development, historical preservation, urban design, and more. Um, another one is that Despite them being in every rural, only 30%, 37% of New Yorkers live within walking distance of an open street. And lastly, Open Streets is a global movement that started a few years ago. New York just picked to use that name in its program because it describes the idea literally. So yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for that amazing um, introduction. If you guys want to learn more about their research, I, I, I apologize for not giving more context for this. Over the summer, the ambassador's final projects, um, they're meant to work in an issue area and focus on a specific New York City topic and create basically a nonpartisan guide for voters to sort of understand how the specific issues they care about are impacted by local elections. So um, be on the lookout for those resources coming our way. And on September 1st, we'll also be doing uh, more in-depth presentations presentations on their research. This is just a sneak peek. Um, so again, uh, we will move into uh, the first set of spoken testifiers. Um, so again, we'll hear from Bradley Hershenson, Mia Payne, followed by Iman Chaudhry. Olivia, I don't see Bradley here. So um, I think we can maybe jump to Mia first. And if I okay. see Bradley, I'll pull him off. All good. Hey, Mia, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. Hi, my name is Mia Payne. I'm an ambassador for Wyvolt. I'm a 17-year-old African-American female wearing box braids, and I'm from the Bronx, New York. And the issue that really strikes the chord for me is environmental racism because it's intersectional with healthcare, housing, and climate justice. Living in the Bronx, I've noticed that there's a disproportionate rate of asthma in Black and Brown communities compared to predominantly white neighborhoods. And when I dived into the source of this issue, I noticed that black and brown areas are unprotected from environmental pollution, toxic waste facilities, and foul odors because of the inequity within socioeconomic status. So environmental racism is strategic, and therefore elected officials need to abolish redlining policies, restructure the housing conditions in communities with low socioeconomic background, and provide health care access for the communities that have been affected by this issue. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Mia. Um, Iman, I'll pass it over to you now. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Iman. Um, I'm a South Asian girl. I have long dark brown hair, brown eyes, and I'm just um, behind my dresser and my white um, white wall in my bedroom. So um, one thing that I've always kind of noticed that's 
that I found very striking as um, an issue in local um, elections in New York City specifically is the lack of care, not care necessarily, but just a lack of focus on um, um, immigration and cultural um, like uplifting because um, immigrants and um, cultural diversity is a big part of New York City and it's what makes our city thrive and it's what makes us one of the best cities in the world in my opinion. I think around 40% of New York City residents are immigrants and even a greater number have um, cultural ties, have um, have connections to different countries in the world. So I think in order for us to really um, honor those people and honor that part of us, we really need to focus on not only um, like uplifting the immigrant communities, but also um, uplifting different countries and trying to find ways to make, um, to have, um, I guess, just like give our resources to other places in the world, other places um, in the, in the city that need this type of support in order for our immigrants to feel as though they're valued and that their contributions are respected. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, so thank you to our first two testifiers. Um, we're now going to move into the environmental justice presentation, um, which is going to be led by um, Eleanor Fecco. Hey, Ellie, you're good to go whenever you're ready. Um, sorry, is it fine if I just keep my camera off? Yeah, if you're not able to turn your camera on, no worries. Sorry, I can't turn my camera on right now. But um, hi, my name is Ellie Seto. And um, for our environmental justice report, we decided to focus on the Devon and the Green Roof um, specifically, but in general, Green Roof as well. Um, so, these are just some interesting facts that I found while we were doing the research that quote well, our group found um, is that they actually introduced three honeybee hives in 2017, and those honeybee hives produce honey. And um, so, like, you can buy the honey from the Javits Center Green Roof, which I find is just super interesting. Um, also, they the Javits Center Green Roof uh, produces for 40,000 pounds. Of produce annually because it has a farm on the green roof. And also just in general, the amount of organizations and just things set up to support green roofs and spread green roofs all over is really interesting because I feel like it's something that we don't really think about much, but it's a really cool part of living in an urban city. Um, and it's really a cool part of environmental justice because um, like it has been, rate for increasing like um they there were a bunch of birds on there too sorry i can't remember the number off the top of my head but um they were like a bunch of different bird species that they found on the green earth that they weren't that, that weren't there before and just in general it's been great for increasing the oh my God, sorry i'm blanking on the word but basically just like increasing the amount of green in the city um, I can't really think of a better term for it, but yeah. Thank you so much, Ellie. And we can definitely hear how excited you and Caroline are about the Javits Green Roof. Um, that's not something I knew anything about. So it's been a pleasure reading your research and learning more about it. Um, so now we're going to hear from a couple more testifiers. Um, we're going to hear from Brissa uh, Ferreria. I totally did not pronounce that correctly. I apologize. Um, Nina Mananu and Ashley Chen. Uh, Bruce, and whenever you're ready to, to start, feel free. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brisa Pereira, and I use she, her pronouns. I am a 16-year-old Latina woman with straight brown hair, and I'm wearing a dark gray shirt. I'm currently sitting in front of my window in my room in front of the highway, so it's a little noisy. I apologize. Um, but this year, I'm going to be a senior at Union Square Academy for Health Sciences, located in downtown Manhattan. And in my experience as a, new, as a young New Yorker, I found that civic engagement is extremely important for students. Um, therefore, today, I'm going to be speaking on this issue. 
I would like to start off by saying that this school year was my first time really ever engaging in civic learning. And from what I've experienced, I think that schools should play a bigger role in helping their students um, stay engaged. It wasn't until I took AP government um, this year for my second semester that I realized how important it was for me to use my voice and represent my fellow students. Thanks to my teacher, Mr. Ed Mr. Edelman, I was able to participate in a bunch of different meets, speeches, forums, and I was able to meet so many great people who also helped me gain a way better understanding with the, um, how important it is for me to use my voice. For example, I was able to speak at Project Soapbox for um, Mikva Challenge. I was, um, it was a forum where students across the country could use their voices to speak about issues that are important to us. Um, I've attended various online election events um, that have really helped me gain a better understanding of how everything works. Um, I've even been able to speak with representatives such as Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. I've, be, I've been able to um, mediate conversations and that was an amazing experience. Um, however, unfortunately not all students have teachers like me that encourage them to be involved. Some students don't even understand that they have the ability to voice their concerns and take a role. With remote learning, it was even more difficult for students to find opportunities like these. So I believe schools should require their teachers to provide their students with way more opportunities and guidance and support. We all deserve the right to learn how to use our voices and make a change. And I think that's the first step in getting our students really motivated and excited about this work. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Nina, you are up next whenever you're ready. Um, hi, my name is Nina Mananu. Um, I use the she, her pronouns, and I am a black 16 year old with brown eyes and black hair and a bun, wearing a light wash denim button down dress and set earrings. Around me is a white wall and a partial window curtain. Um, I live in the Bronx, New York, and I'm a part of the Why Vote Changemaker Institute, which is a youth driven program that looks through the lens of the question, why vote? And so it's a collective of young people like me that want to explore the intersectionality of electoral politics and activism individually and communally. So as a why voter, I help to brainstorm and develop strategies to increase civic engagement. And so I want to start off by saying that there's nothing more expensive than a missed opportunity. So if you picture a family of like one parent and four kids, so they moved to New York to support themselves and the little sister is able to get into a great school in Manhattan and all the sister is also able to get into a high school near there as well because of the thriving school system up there and she's able to pick her little sister up and drop her off. But then the little sister is moved to a school in a branch in Harlem for her middle school where it suffers from an educational gap and socioeconomic disparities. And so the chance of the little sister having to drop her education from that school to a branch in the Bronx, where it's known for its leisure quality of education, is exactly what they were running away from. And so the chance of getting higher education and an equal chance of learning is lower. And the schools have been notified, the DOE has been notified, and it falls on deaf ears. And so this is rooted on this apparent segregation of schools in New York neighborhoods and the correlation between the poverty of the neighborhoods and the quality of the schooling. So the school I'm in is a predominantly white school, but it's such a good school, right? But the amount of times I felt like I was just filling a quota for the school to be racially equal is kind of insane. And so, but the reality is that um, living in a disadvantaged neighborhood substantially reduces economic, academic achievement. And so the school environment also does not interact with neighborhood contacts because attending a high quality school is similarly beneficial whether children reside in an advantaged or disadvantaged neighborhood. So I saw in a study from NYU that the correlation between high poverty zones and low poverty in New York to the graduation rate in such zones using the high poverty census tract showed that in the Bronx, where they had high poverty, the graduation rate is 51 to 66%. But in neighborhoods in Manhattan that had low poverty rates, it was 67 to 100% rate. And so those kids that have gone through something like this, where their parents or parent doesn't believe in sending them to a school in their neighborhood or similar to it due to their own situations and the education there, they don't feel like 
anybody will listen to them. They don't feel like their voices will matter. And they grow up and they don't want to vote again because their words will fall on deaf ears and empty promises are made instead of action. So in the Bronx, the youth voter turnout is only 32.4%, as Olivia showed. Um, and they don't think it's worth the price of being so there are borough presidents and community boards and public advocates and council members that should have their ears open, but they don't. And so, and the few that do, they create such a great change for the people. And so like the NYC Community Schools, which is like a program in all these schools that focus on the children and not just the curriculum or the teacher quality and civic engagement in classes. And so it keeps the students engaged as well as the parents as well. So it's an opportunity to start taking the youth voices seriously and trying to help these kids that are in these low poverty or high poverty um, neighborhoods get an equal chance of edu education. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, Ashley, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Olivia. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Ashley Chen. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a 20-year-old East Asian woman with short black hair, brown eyes, wearing glasses, and a gray shirt. I'm sitting in front of a cream-colored wall. I'm a community organizer and a rising junior at Brew College. Um, to provide some background, I started organizing in my community when I was 16 years old. Um, there was a need to amplify the voices of Asian Americans, but more specifically, young Asian American voices. However, the issue was not necessarily disengagement, but the lack of knowledge on government and the ways we can leverage power. I saw this educational gap within my community and decided that I could provide the resources and information. I went door to door passing out one pagers that outlined the basics of government and the ways that we could get involved. Voting and government was and continues to be personal to me. My ancestors didn't have the opportunity to vote until the 1940s, and it wasn't until the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that we really saw this come to fruition. Especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, it has only magnified and amplified the need for elected officials that are truly representative of their constituents. We need strong and responsive leadership, which is why youth voter participation is so important. Voter outreach isn't simply about asking young people to register to vote, but to provide the resources and information to learn about the candidates, the budget process, the dynamics of different city agencies, and the ways that we can be active participants. During this past election cycle, many of my peers contacted me to ask about the policies of each candidate and to better understand the ranked choice voting system. The confusion surrounding the RCV system was pervasive within my community and is because of the lack of accessible information, especially with folks who don't have broadband access or the language capacity. This newly implemented system was pivotal in selection and to have people completely confused by the process at the voting booth is devastating. To prevent future confusion surrounding the voting process, we need to address the lack of broadband access and making sure there are paper versions of all materials that are not only easy to follow, but translated. Given that my community is predominantly composed of immigrants and or limited English proficient speakers, it is essential that there's individual outreach and events that seek directly to them to communicate this information. I saw firsthand the effectiveness of door-to-door -door outreach and educating people on how the government works and encouraging the AAPI community to help we should be doing the same with community processes like RCB and future voter outreach efforts, especially to our marginalized communities. Each and every voter should be equipped with proper information to make informed decisions, as well as be able to exercise their power to the fullest extent. This speaks upon the need for broader advocacy work and mixed civics, an integral part of our academic curriculum, um, and to pass um, certain bills to allow for that curriculum to, to happen. On that note, accessible and accurate information is crucial to us. When we have access to this information, we're able to utilize that to create meaningful change. Creating an environment where young people are welcomed, empowered, and encouraged to participate in community, wards, local government, and civics is necessary. There must be structural changes within these institutions because the historical exclusion of our voices is merely a disservice to our community because young people will be leading the next revolution. I want to close off by saying that making government and voting accessible to young people is vital in strengthening our democracy. Most importantly, it reminds young people of the power that they wield in the communities. When we foster this culture and attitude, we create an environment where radical change is consistently happening. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so very much, Ashley, and to the rest of the testifiers. Um, and I, I should have done this earlier, but I, again, if, if back, if any of you have questions, follow up questions for any of the testifiers, feel free to chime in. Um, but if not, we can go ahead and move into our final ambassador presentation for the evening um, uh, from Sierra Chowdhury, who is in the education group.
Hi, I'm Ciara. I'm 16 and a rising senior in high school. I'm a South Asian woman with wavy black hair, and I'm currently in my room today. And I'm representing my group, which is uh, racial inequality. And we decided to focus on how racial inequality specifically exists in our public school system. So um, New York City has the most segregated school system in the entire nation, surprisingly. And one of the causes for this is specialized high schools. And according to the DOE, the majority of New York City public school students are either Black or Hispanic. However, only 9 to 10% of Black and Hispanic students make up the population of all specialized high schools combined. And that means that the specialized high schools as a whole remain unrepresented unrepresentative of New York City's total student population. And in addition, the Black and Latino students at these schools often face racially motivated attacks and hear racially offensive statements on a regular basis. And the perpetrators are not held accountable by school administrators, which makes it a very hostile environment for them to thrive in. And the issue has existed for nearly 90 years and has yet to be addressed in any capacity. As it stands today, the near future of the SHSAT lies in the hands of the city council. And so some next steps you can do is reach out to your local council members in regards to fighting for inclusion and the review process and attend DOE town halls or keep a tab on the issue by like researching and monitoring, monitoring their progress. and continue to have conversations with others about the state of this issue. Thank you so much. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing that. And I really like the way that you included like multiple different ways to get involved that are accessible for everyone, regardless of your age or like experience level. So thank you for your research. Um, we have two testifiers left um, to sign up. If there's anyone who's interested, uh, we have time. If there's anyone who's interested in sharing some remarks um, after our last two testifiers go, um, feel free to just send me or Jordan a message and we'll promote you to a panelist afterwards. Um, but first, let's hear from Marifer Sanchez and Kayla Green. Awesome. Uh, Marifer, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and start sharing. I guess I can go first. Um, so, so hi, my name is Kayla Green and I am a 21 year old black female. I have a, a purplish, purplish off-white background. I am from the Bronx, New York. I'm wearing a black dress. And one of the things I have witnessed with a lot of young people is, is some social media propaganda about voting and about just, just world issues in, in general. And, and I think that because social media is like the new news and there was so much false information going on there, a, a lot of young people will get confused and and decide to believe opinions instead of actual facts. And one of the of the things that I've also witnessed is that that a lot of young people, well, especially of a, a, around my age range, we are all talk about problems, but but we're not taking that extra step to to see change. And and that is because just talking about it and. And just complaining is super easy, but but taking a leadership role of some sort is is a bit challenging and it's a bit of a risk. But but not every everything that that will have a positive outcome um, should should be easy. And so I think that there should be more resources to, to schools and and to this generation of young people and comparing the. The difference between facts and and uh, opinions and modern day propaganda and and we also need more more workshops on on votings and the misconceptions and and what the process is actually like besides the basics also the benefits of 
of voting and how your voices can, can be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing, Taylor. Uh, Merifer, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, all. My name is Vera Frisichas. I am a rising senior at the New York Harbor School, but most importantly, I'm also co-founder of District 38's uh, Youth Committee. Initially, the Youth Committee served as a PB, Participatory Budgeting Initiative. Um, we wanted to um, create a platform to amplify youth voice throughout the PB uh, process. If you don't know PB, is money allocated by city council members for the community. Constituents come together and propose ideas for community engagement projects. And the community comes together to vote on what proposals they want to see come to life. In District 38, the voting age starts at 11. And because of that, we knew that there were a lot of young members in our community that weren't being heard. And that's why we created our youth committee. Um, and although we were a product of the pandemic, as a team we persevered and found a way to encourage, encourage the youth in our community. Uh, currently, my team is working towards being a community tutoring center. And all the success is all thanks to our supportive city council staff. So I'm here on behalf of our district and my youth team to urge other city council members to provide the same support we received, uh, their youth of their community, and to urge the youth of New York to speak out and seek help when needed, because as we know, our youth is the future of our country's success. Thank you. Thank you so very much for sharing. Um, I do, I'll make one last, I sent a message in the chat, but if there's anyone who's on the Zoom call right now who would like to share a few words about their experience, um, I will give you a few seconds to respond. Um, if not, I'll just quickly ask, um, oh, uh, Robert, um, Jordan, could you go ahead and promote Robert? Thank you. All right. Hi, Robert, whenever you're ready, feel free to, to share. Um, Robert, you're still on mute if you happen to be speaking. Got it. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. I chair the Youth and Education Committee in Bronx Community Board 10. And I find it's very difficult reaching out to young people to get them to voice their needs and their opinions and their wants. So we could really use more help in doing that. Uh, I also am the president of the 45th Police Community Council, where we also interact with our explorers, which is the youth organization in the police department. And, and I do get to see some amazing young people, and, and I feel always great about it. But I'd like to see more young people get involved in community boards. You can now apply for a seat on the community board at 17 years old. So I don't know if a lot of these young people that want to get involved know that, or if they're familiar with community boards. But community boards are really the first stop for any city agency. Any issue that may come up, whatever may arise, it's a great place for you to go with any of your community issues or things that you want to see happen. The community boards can be advocates for you and help you get some of those things you want to see happen. You know, most politics in my mind is local. You know, it really is. You know, it's about getting your playground fixed. It's about having a problem in your neighborhood, whatever it may be. You know, it's your day-to-day -day life activities. And your community board is where you should bring in those to. And by having a seat on that board, it gives you a voice in your local community like no other. So I really want to 
get young people to say, yes, I want to be on a community board. So whatever your neighborhood may be, you know, go to your bar president's office, get the application and apply to the community board. I want more people on my board. I hear these young girls here from the Bronx and I'm thrilled, but I want more. <laughs> so I see you have a small group here, you know, 14 to 25 year olds, which is great. But I want to hear more about what they want and, and how we can go about really making those changes. Um, right now, there's a charter revision going on. And I don't know how many of the youth in your organization realize that the city charter is what our government is mandated to do and how it runs. Well, every mayor has an opportunity for a charter revision. And here we have a charter revision being reviewed. And this is an opportunity for them to look at that and say, you know what, some of the things that are in there just aren't right. We want to make changes. I personally am advocating in the charter revision so that local borough presidents can appoint local commissioners. Years ago, they used to. Now they're all appointed by the mayor's office. So anything you want done in your community, you go to your local commissioner, and they're not really happy to do anything unless it's okay downtown. You know, they're not fighting for their borough because it would mean fighting against the mayor's office. But if the borough president appointed them, then you'd have a much better say in the local community. So again, these are things that the charter revision can hopefully help us change and improve in our day-to-day -day lives. And getting more young people involved, I, I think there's no important, more important goal than that. You know, I, I know even me, I, I grew up in a, in a family that was always involved, but what really became important to me is when I had a child of my own, you know? And I think that's what inspires most people to really want to make things better. But, you know, getting people before that age, you know, before they start having kids involved, I, I'm, I'm a great fan of it. And anything I can do to help promote this organization and learn more about it, I'd love to have these come up to my community board and, you know, see what we can do to promote this some more. Thank you for your time. Robert, thank you so much for sharing that. I think that was some really helpful insight for our young people just on like how, you know, what CVs do and how, what some of those processes look like. Um, I would love to connect afterwards. We have a ton of resources. I'd be happy to come, you know, talk to your community board. I'll send you my email address. Um, and if you share some resources for me, I can send them out to our young people. I can include them in our monthly youth newsletter um, just about getting involved with your community boards. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Um, I will give a final call. Does anyone else have any remarks they'd like to share? Or just like if you have questions for us about our programming, if you have questions for any of the members at the back, um, they come from a wide range of experiences and have a lot of information. Okay. Um, any Amy or any members in the back, do you guys have any comments or questions? Yeah, I just want to thank the uh, young people who did so much work on these projects and all the ones who testified and, you know, always incredibly impressed with the really, you know, self-motivating uh, work that you do. And so hopefully we can support that work, you know, on, in the coming year and take some of your ideas and build on our uh, youth programming based on what you've said. Anyone else? Oh, Christopher, go ahead. Thanks so much, Olivia. Uh, I'm Christopher Malone. I am a member of the VAC. Uh, I am a middle-aged white male. I have uh, clear rim glasses. I'm wearing a black shirt. Uh, I have uh, more gray hair than brown at this point in my life. Uh, I'm in my uh, Queens apartment. I found out tonight that Queens is the biggest geographical borough. I, I wasn't, so I learned something. I learned a lot of new things, but that was probably the, the thing that hit home closely. And I'm in my, uh, my apartment um, home office with a very busy wall behind me um, with most of my 10 year olds paintings on the wall. The favorite of mine over my left shoulder is her favorite meal, which is an emoji burger with French fries and uh, a chocolate shake. So. Hopefully that paints 
who I am and where I am. I just want to say a couple of things. Um, I'm a political scientist by training, and I've been teaching politics and government uh, since I was a doctoral student, um, you know, almost 30 years ago now. It was great to, to listen to the young people, but it was even better to hear them. Um, and, and I did hear just wonderful things. You know, when I teach this stuff in classes or when I try to teach this stuff, um, I think we have to remember that um, we are the oldest uh, experiment in self-government in this country. Um, we are the government, we are the people. And I know that sounds cliche, but the experiment in self-government is not a guarantee of success. And we're the ones that have to make that happen. And today in not only New York City, but in the United States, um, we are in a, a, a fight, I think, for a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-gender, multi-generational, I probably could add many more, um, society. There are many people in this country that don't believe we should be any of those things or all of those things. And the example tonight of these young people who were across the spectrum um, is an example of how we're going to win the exercise in self-government that we are. And in New York City, that means being on a community board. It means being on a voluntary committee like this. And I'm just honored to be part of that. So for the young people, I want to thank you. But also, you know, everyone talks about you being the future. Well, the future of the, 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 the experiment in democracy really, you know, lies with you. And um, I'm hopeful, more hopeful today, tonight than I was probably when I woke up this morning. So thank you. I just want to um, thank you for um, all of your testimonies. Thanks. Thank you, Christopher. Um, if any other staff want to share anything or members of the back, now is your chance to chime in before we I share some election dates and we do our group reflection. So yes. just, uh, please go ahead. Sorry, um, Jamela Rose again, and I'll re-describe myself because I forgot to do it earlier. I'm a black woman with uh, a poofy Afro ponytail wearing a blue dress and I'm sitting in front of um, a white wall next to French, um, wooden French doors. Um, yes, I just wanted to say really quickly, I'm in agreement with everything that was already said, especially what Christopher just mentioned. And I just think you all who testified are an amazing group of young people who are so intelligent. The future of New York City is surely bright if you remain here. And um, you know, hearing everything from environmental justice to even the poetry and talking about the naturalization process um, and, and all the other things and ranked choice voting, all of you are so informed. And I feel very, very hopeful about the future of this city because of the way that you all presented tonight. So thank you so much for sharing those testimonies and for allowing us a little piece, um, a little insight into your lives. That's all I have to say and have a good night. Uh, this is Eric Friedman and, and I described myself earlier, but I, I wanna second and endorse everything Jamela just said. And, and I wanna thank Olivia for, for your work on, on, on this hearing and then creating the space for, for uh, for all these young people to show up um, and talk about the things that matter to them, and I want to congratulate the ambassadors for their presentations, um, and for really for for all the young people who came and shared tonight. Um, I mean, this this really it's, it's a great reminder of how and why young people, really all people, get involved with politics, get involved with government, uh, and the most powerful reason to do it is to make change on the issues that matter in their everyday lives. Um, and so I, I, I share Jamila's hope in, in, in the future of the city. Um, and, and I thank everybody again for, for showing up, participating, and for your continued participation uh, well into the future. Anything else you want to share? Okay, awesome. So um, I would be remiss if my job is telling young people about how to vote. I would be remiss if I did not share some important election uh, updates and resources with you all. Um, so again, we're going into a general election. We'll be voting for mayor um, and several other, several city council seats um, and a ton of other super important positions that really impact our day-to-day -day lives as New Yorkers. If you are 16 or 17, you can pre-register to vote. You won't be eligible to vote until you turn 18, but fill that form out now while you can, while you're thinking about it. 
Um, if you are 18, make sure that you are registered by October 8th in order to participate in this general election. Um, once again, everyone will be eligible to vote by mail. Um, uh, you can do that online at nycabsentee.com. Um, you want to be sure to request by October 26th. That is the deadline. Do not wait until you know 5 p.m. on October 26th to request your absentee ballot. Do it as soon as possible. I believe the portal is open right now. Um, and if you have any questions about that, you can go check us out on social media at NYC Votes um, or visit our website, voting.nyc, for more information. Um, and then to return that absentee ballot, you can either put it in the mail for which you'll need postage to do, or you can drop it off at your early voting site um, or any, any early voting or election day site. It doesn't even have to be the one that you're registered at. Um, that's personally how I have, you know, done, have voted the last couple of times. I've dropped mine and my partner's ballot off at our early voting site. Um, there are secure boxes. Um, and again, early voting is going to run from the 23rd to 31st. Election day, if you really want to vote on a Tuesday, will be November 2nd. Um, and you know, we have a lot of options for voting this year. It can feel overwhelming. I know I'm talking really fast. So again, if you go to voting.nyc, um, it's our nonpartisan resource sec website. Um, again, really look at your options. Think about what makes sense for you, your lifestyle. Um, and if you have questions, you can always reach out to us on social media, or I've shared my email dozens of times. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, and just some resources again, voting.nyc, your one stop shop for like everything you need to know. We also have a pledge to vote. If you text vote smart to this number on the screen here, vote smart to 1917-976-6377. I'll drop that in the chat. Um, you know, you'll get nonpartisan updates um, and reminders about upcoming deadlines and elections. And then we also will have a nonpartisan voter guide up closer to the actual election. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing really quickly and I'm going to reshare my screen. Um, we're going to do a little group reflection activity with a word wall um, or a word cloud. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, if you go to menti.com, I'm sharing the link here with y'all in the chat, um, you'll be able to you will be asked to um, just share a sentence, um, a phrase, a word that really stuck out with you tonight. Um, Christopher, you could share that you learned that Queens is the largest borough by land area, um, but I'll give everyone is invited to participate in this. Um, and this will just be sort of our group reflection on what we've learned and what we'll walk away with. And I've got the live results. It may also ask you to type in a code, which I'm also going to share in the chat. Awesome, and I'm seeing folks submitting. This is so cool. I love that land use is on the board. Very, very cool. I love like seeing everyone's reflections together. I'll be sure to share the link um, with this out in a follow up email so everyone who attended can continue um, to look at this as the results change. Um, but yeah, I think it's some of the words that have come up a lot, obviously youth, uh, voting, engagement. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just loving to see the, some of the ideas and thoughts that folks are taking away with them. Um, okay, so I will leave this up as we do our closeout in case anyone else submits. Um, but I just wanna, you know, again, thank the, the campaign finance board and the VAC for just always supporting our youth work. Um, it's really special to be at an agency that prioritizes young voices so much, um, especially in government. It's a rare thing to find. Um, and I'm always just incredibly grateful to, to continue to work with such an amazing agency and such an amazing group of colleagues. Um, so yeah, that's all I have to, to share. Um, if anyone else, uh, Amy or the VAC wants to close us out, feel free.
sorry, a little difficulty unmuting, sorry. <laughs> but, um, well, thank you all for attending and um, I uh, look forward to working with all you young people in the future. And again, thank you, Olivia, for putting together such a great program. Great, thank you so much, everyone. I think that's our event for the evening. Thank you for, for joining us and listening to all these just incredible young people. Have a good time, everybody. See you at the polls. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night.